Well, I kind of uh, got tossed the baton mid-morning when we found out Connie wasn't going to make it. So I don't have anything for you that's like organized. I'm just going to like throw it all out there. Is that all right? So just catch it. It might not be in the right order, but you know, you can catch something. So immediately, uh, you know, how many of you guys were, were at ATR in 2017 when I did the teaching uh, Miracles Are Normal? Okay, so what happened, so, so some of you guys remember this, um, and what happened over the last couple years is the Lord told me to, to take that teaching and to write a book. So I'm in the middle of a book, I'm in, I'm working on <laughs> chapter 8 of 12 chapters, and so the joke around our house is I manifest in every chapter, and <laughs> so because the Lord told me, he said, um, in 2018, the Lord put me in a co-creation classroom where he wanted to teach me how to co-create with him. And I was having a lot of, I was having some trouble with that classroom. And so the Lord reminded me of that teaching that I had done the year before. He goes, that's your curriculum. <coughs> so I'm living this and grinding this out and contending to make it mine while, while he's feeding it to me from heaven. So, um, so anyway, uh, I'm in chapter eight. So, you know, when I'm there, I'm kind of, that's all my thoughts and it's kind of what he's feeding me. And so immediately I thought, well, you know, let me share that. Let me share some tidbits with you tonight. Some of it is, a, you know, some of the things that maybe you've heard before, but I think we need to be reminded of it. I think it's a timely murder word. I'm going to talk about the imagination. So for you guys that weren't here, oh, I forgot. Heidi said, um, speaking of the alabaster box on January 4th, to remind you guys that are watching uh, by live stream that to do it with us at home and just to release your creativity to the Lord from home. So sorry. Um, so you guys that didn't hear the original teaching, I'm not going to go through the whole thing. But basically what the Lord showed me is that, you know, in Genesis 1, God, he created, we all know that, he but it was a pattern. He revealed a pattern in scripture. So we know that the word in the beginning, God, we know that word is Elohim. It's a plural word. And so we know it's talking about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, how they co-created together. We also know it's talking about us. We're Elohim. When Jesus said, you know, your scriptures say we are gods. That's the word Elohim. I'm not going to get off on that tonight. But basically, the idea is that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit created together in creation, and they each had a part in it. You know, we know the Trinity is three, but also one. So they each had a specific part in it, and that's a pattern that we can follow as we co-create with God here. And so basically, Everything originated first in the mind of the Father. And I've, I've been into his mind, and it's amazing. You go in there, and it's just you can't even, you pick up one little tiny grain of sand and put it in your belly. You feel like you're going to explode. But there's strategies and formulas and blueprints and, and things you, you can't even comprehend inside his mind. And as we're born again, out of our oneness with him, we have access to that place. So everything that we see around us originated first in the mind of Father God. Right? Then what we, we know the scripture. Um, what happened? What did Holy Spirit do? Remember, he brooded over the void, right? So Holy Spirit broods over that thought. And um, so Holy Spirit, one of, the, one of the definitions for spirit besides ruach or breath literally means feelings. It's when you break down the Hebrew word ruach. So the, our thoughts correspond to Father. Our emotions correspond to Holy Spirit. And we know what Jesus is what in the beginning was the word. So he's the word made flesh. He's the word. So what Holy Spirit started to show me is when we come into alignment with God first, right? It's all about surrender to him. We can't, you know, we, we want to be in alignment with him. But when we come into alignment with him and into alignment with ourselves, miracles are normal. They're not supposed to be unusual. They're supposed to be the norm. They're how we were created. Everything, I had an encounter, and some of you guys have heard this story, but several years ago, I ended up in the heart of the Father dancing on the fiery stones. And it's Ezekiel 37. And this is all stuff I went into in the other teaching, so I'm just kind of flying past it tonight. But um, the Lord ended up showing me that's one of the many mansions in his heart that are available to us. 
And so what I saw is that everything is already done in the heart of the Father out in that realm outside of time. The Bible says what in him all things consist, right? So in the realm outside of time, if you're, how many of you guys in here are believing for something that you have not seen manifest yet? That you've prayed for something? Okay, all of us. It already exists in the Father's heart. It's already done. It's already completed. It's already yes and amen. So when we pray, some people think when we pray, we're trying to like, you know, get God to change his mind and be nice to us. That's not what's going on. When we pray, it keeps us connect. Jesus said, remember when he said, hey, when he was, when the disciples said, teach us to pray. And he said, he, before he said, pray this way, remember, he said, now remember, don't pray like the, the heathen people, the Pharisees and all that. He said, remember that your father already knows what you need before you ask him. So why do we pray? If he already knows. We're not changing his mind because God is good. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So prayer changes us. It keeps us connected to him so we can receive what's already done. So that's the key. And um, the teaching talks a lot about the double-minded man and how when we're not receiving something, it's because there's places, either our thoughts, our emotions, or our words are out of alignment. And he wants to bring those things back. So if you want to go back and review that teaching, um, it's, um, I think it's on the ATR blog called Miracles Are Normal. And it's, I think it's on my website too, virginiakillingsworth.com. It's just an audio teaching. But that might catch you up with us. It basically just kind of is a, the mini version of how to align your thoughts, your emotions, and your words with what God is saying so that you're an unobstructed channel so that what's already done in the heavenly realm can manifest in the earth. So we're not trying to get him to do something. We're not trying to get something to happen that hasn't already happened. We're just posturing ourselves to receive, to be his womb on the earth. It's like um, you ever transferred a file from one computer to the other, like with a thumb drive or something? It's just keeping connected long enough for what's already done in his heart to manifest in the earth realm. Jesus said in John 15, abide in me and I in you. And what did he say? If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask what you will. And so that's the abiding. It's perfect alignment with him and with ourself. That's the harder part. And that keeping that connection so that miracles can flow through us into the earth. And they're not supposed to be unusual. That was our original design. We were not created to be under the laws of earth. We were created to have dominion over them, over time, over space. Jesus demonstrated in everything that he did. He walked on the water. He transfigured. He raised the dead. He showed that we are not to be under the, the limitations of this earth realm. And that's all available to us. And all we have to do is just come into alignment with ourselves. Because sometimes, what does the Bible say? The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who, know, who can know it? So we don't always know what's resonating in our heart especially the subconscious layers of our being. And that's not a condemning statement. That's just telling us we're not aware. But the next verse says, I, the Lord, know the heart. So we don't always know there's stuff stored in our subconscious memory that's resonating stuff, and we're seeing this fruit happen in our life. And what do we always say? Where there's, a fr where there's fruit, there's a root. So if you're seeing something that you don't like in your life, the fruit of some kind of drama or lack or poverty or anything, there is a root in you. And that's, there's no condemnation. That's Holy Spirit going, hey, let me fix that for you. Because where there's, where there's fruit, there's a root. Your words reveal what's in your heart, right? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if you're always saying stuff silently or out loud, oh, I'm stupid or I'm ugly or I'm always broke or I never have enough time, then, yeah, those words themselves are creating that. But it's also revealing stuff that are in the depths of your heart. And I like you guys, you guys that have been with us for a while have probably heard Connie share this example, and I love it. She says, okay, how many of you remember being potty trained? And oh, not, oh, nobody raises their hand. But we're pretty sure that we're all reaping the benefits of that event in our life today. <laughs> Hopefully. So that shows us that there's stuff that's buried in our unconscious mind that we no longer remember that very much affects us today. And so, but Holy Spirit can reveal it. So this is like the itty-bitty part of this teaching because I just really want to get to the imagination, but I wanted to give you a little bit of a foundation in realizing 
that once we come into alignment with God and once we come into alignment with ourselves, once Holy Spirit reveals the thoughts that we're thinking that are too small, anything of lack, anything of orphan, anything of victim, anything of limitation, anything of poor me, anything of I'm at the mercy of, that's something that needs to be aligned because we're transformed by the renewing of our mind. That's our conscious mind. And then we're also renewed. The word mind um, doesn't just mean our conscious mind. It also means our subconscious and our unconscious layers of our mind. So that's where Holy Spirit wants to reveal. We need to examine the, the fruit of our lives and where he wants to bring those things that might be hidden in there so he can heal them. So if, you, if you've got a repetitive cycle in your life where you always two steps forward, three steps back, there's something resonating in your soul that Holy Spirit just wants you to ask him about so he can eradicate it because you were not created for limitation. If there's sickness in your body, if, there, if you have problem remember, remembering things, if you're aging, if you always uh, can't get, ever get ahead financially, there's something in your soul. There's something that was handed down to you in the DNA. There was something that's, that, was ha- that you picked up. Usually stuff is handed to us in the DNA, then it's reinforced because the people that handed us to, in the DN- to us in the DNA are the ones that raised us. So there's layer, 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 but where there's a fruit, there's a root. So don't, don't be afraid of it. It doesn't mean you're a bad person. It just means there's something resonating that's not who you really are, and guess what? You can get rid of it. It's like taking off a garment that's too small. You weren't created for this. You weren't created for lack. You weren't created for death. You weren't created for poverty. You weren't created for failure. So if there's something creating that in your world, okay, it's not, ev- it's not 500 bosses' fault. It's not, every, it's not the fault of every boss you've ever had in your whole life. It doesn't mean you're a bad person. It just means there's something resonating in your soul that Holy Spirit wants to shift. That's all. Repent. Think another thought. If you're always running out of time, it's not the clock's fault. If you never have enough money, you know, it's not, it's not your wife's fault. Now, that doesn't mean there's not soul ties and stuff bouncing back and forth that you might both need to deal with. If you've attracted 15 abusive relationships, guess what? There's something resonating in your soul because you weren't created for that. You were created for love. So once Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth, reveals it, then love, God is love, can transform it because love transforms whatever it touches. So if there's something that happened in your life that was horrible... Or something about yourself, maybe a sin that you, can't get, that you haven't gotten victory over yet. Or something that you know is less than God's best for you. And you spend all your energy hating it. Guess what? You're re- reinforcing that cycle. You release love into it. Now, that doesn't mean you love that something awful happened. That doesn't mean you love the sin that you're in bondage to. But God is love. So when you love yourself... And you release love into that memory, into that trauma, into that place, into your body. When you look at that person in the mirror and you release love, you're blowing that thing up with the greatest power in the earth. It's God. So when we spend all our energy hating that thing, we just keep, we keep on the hamster wheel. But when truth reveals it, love demolishes it. Because perfect love casts out fear. Love transforms everything it touches. So, you know, Jesus, remember what Jesus said when they were talking, when the Jews had all these laws and all this crazy stuff about how they trim their beard and all this stuff. And Jesus said, you know, whoa, 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 whoa. Remember what he said? He said, it all can be summed up in this. Love. You guys know it. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and love your neighbor as you love yourself. Not instead of yourself, by the way, because we're taught that in church. I was taught that. Jesus, others, yourself. That's how J-O-Y. So I spent most of my life dishonoring myself. It's called codependent Christianity, and I kept wondering why there was no fruit, because Jesus never said that. He's finally like, oh, by the way, I never told you that. That was the religion. Because he said, I told you to love others as you love yourself. So what that means is every problem you have in your life, without exception, is a manifestation of the violation of the law of love. 
without exception. It's an area that you either have trouble receiving or loving, receiving love from God or loving him wholeheartedly, an area that you're having trouble receiving love or giving love to other people, or an area that you cannot love yourself completely, unconditionally. Some of you are arguing with me in your head. Well, this is different. No, it's not. I promise you, everything, somehow, every issue that you have in your life that is less than God's amazing destiny that he has for you is a manifestation of a violation of the law of love somehow. And if you're arguing with me in your head, I just ask Holy Spirit and he'll show you. If you've attracted abusive relationships, guess what? You haven't loved yourself completely. Maybe you think you have, but you haven't. And Holy Spirit will reveal it if you ask him. So that's, how we, that's, that's a really short version of how we come into alignment. And our words. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. We know that. And there's some really cool, uh, there's a lot, of, um, a lot of scientific experiments that have been done. You, most of you guys are probably familiar with uh, Dr. Emoto that did the hidden messages in water. How many of you guys are not familiar with that? Okay, so the Japanese uh, scientist did an experiment with a um, high-powered microscope where he, um, he could see water crystals really, you know, with this microscope. And he would, um, he would say or speak or write positive words to them, you know, like, I love you, you're beautiful, uh, things like that. And they would, he would, when he would take the pictures with, this under, with these water crystals under this microscope, they would be beautiful, like exquisite, intricate snow, snowflake-looking patterns. And then he would say stuff like, I hate you, I'm going to kill you, Satan, demon, stuff like that. And they would just be grotesque and misformed and just, I mean, he, you could tell it was very obvious. And we're like, a, like 60, 65% water. Right? So we, our words do have power. So they not only reveal what's in our heart, but they create. They really do create. And he did another experiment that was very similar with rice. And a lot of people have done this at home. If you Google it online, you'll see all kind of crazy stuff. But he did, he had these three jars, and he put rice with water in them, and he did the same thing. So one jar, he would go in every day, and he said, thank you to this rice. And the other jar, he said, I hate you, or something like that. And then the, other, the third jar, he ignored, and he did it every day for like a month or something. And what happened with the first jar that he said, thank you, it fermented and turned a really pleasant smell. And the second one that he said, I hate you, it, uh, it began to, like, yeah, it turned black. And then the one that was ignored was even worse. It completely rotted. And so his point was that neglect is even worse than abuse. It's a big deal. And so a lot of people, if you Google it, a lot of people are like, I tried it and it didn't work. And so I was like looking over there. I'm like, I really thought that was true, you know, and I was kind of praying about it. Like, I really think there's something to this. And Holy Spirit was like, well, of course there is because it's about intent. So these people are like, well, this probably isn't going to work anyway, and it doesn't work. They're like, see, it doesn't work. Well, that proves that it works because it's about, it was about their intent. The whole point of the thing was it's about what you're resonating. So I'm like, oh, okay. So, it, uh, okay, that's awesome. Roderick says he's tried it. Yeah. So, so anyway, it's about coming into alignment so we can co-create with God. So tonight, I just want to, that was kind of like, I, I didn't mean to go in that much detail about the review, but I really want to talk about the imagination because to me, this is the, this is the really fun one. The other stuff is fun too, but this is really fun. And um, what the imagination does, you know, it's about agreement of thought, word, and, and um, feeling, right? Imagination is the way that we weave all those together and it becomes like a womb of creation. So how many of you guys believe that God can resurrect the dead? We all do. How many of you believe that he can use you to resurrect the dead? Okay. How many of you believe that we never have to be sick? We never have to age. We never have to die. Okay, yeah. We <laughs> Okay, so I believe that too. I've prayed for corpses. I have not had one set up yet. So, right? So, I've got a little bit of a gap between what I firmly know to be true and what I've experienced so far. Anybody else have a wee bit of a gap there? 
the Lord was showing me that imagination bridges the gap between what we know to be true and what we're actually experiencing. Because when you can see it, then, then it can happen. So I've got uh, my area, I've got, I've got an area that, that I'm specifically targeting in my classroom, and I just, I can't, like, I haven't been able to see it, and the Lord was showing me, okay, I know what God has said. So my thoughts are aligned with his thoughts. Um, my heart is like, yes, God, you know, I'm here and all that stuff. But the Lord was showing me it's the imagination is the proactive way that we connect what we know to be true and what God has said and what he's promised with what we're actually experiencing. So it's huge. So our thoughts, think about it when you imagine something, right? You're thinking the thoughts, you're feeling the feelings. Do you know your subconscious, your subconscious doesn't know the difference between when you see something on TV and when you're really experiencing it. I mean, your conscious mind does. But you feel those same feelings. So when you imagine something, you're literally feeling the feelings as if it's happening. You are using that as a son to co-create. That's why Jesus said you have to be as a little child to enter the kingdom of heaven. What do kids do? Mm -hmm. Big time imagination. So... What you desire to see without, you must see within. Oh, I forgot I had this here. This little fancy thing here. All right. Okay, that was way back there like 30 minutes ago. But I have a little PowerPoint. It's so nice. Okay, so where the... Um, oh, I want to tell you this story before I read the scripture. You want to hear a cool story? It's not, it's not like Christian or anything like that, but it is... It is I mean, it's true. So um, in 1979, this uh, psychologist and author, this, she wrote a book called Counterclockwise. She's not a believer as far as I know of. Her name's Ellen Langer. She decided to do a really uh, unorthodox ex experiment on um, the power of the imagination. So she had four graduate students, and they put an ad in the paper, and they wanted people that were in their late 70s or early 80s to be part of this experiment, and they called it like a study on uh, reminiscing, is what they called it. And so they got, uh, they ended up with 16 volunteers, so they divided them in two groups. Eight was the control group, and eight was the experimental group. And what they did is, oh, oh this was cool. So beforehand, they're like, we want to we wanna study, we got to have some specific markers, how you, you know, how you can gauge age. So they talked to all these um, gerontologists, to people that are, you know, older people's doctors and study aging and stuff like that, to find out what are measurable bio biological markers of aging. And guess what they found out? There aren't any. There are no specific, tangible biological markers of aging. And this is geriatric doctors saying this. Hello. That's huge. And that's not even the cool part yet. So, so they found that out. So they're like, okay, well, we've got to measure something. So they just um, they tested weight, dexterity, flexibility, eyesight, memory. They took photographs of everybody to compare, you know, like before and after. The experiment was just a week long, but they took before and after pictures, and they did a... a a psychiatric self-evaluation. And so then they found this, they were looking for a place that could be, that they could pull off as being like kind of timeless. So they found this old monastery in Peterborough, New Hampshire, and they, they were able, they thought, okay, this is a timeless enough place that we can make this like it would have been in 1959. And so they did, down to the most minute detail, everything that you would have seen in 1959, nothing that was more recent than that. And so the experimental group was told to live as if it were, for the week that they were there, to live as if it were actually 1959. And so um, they, were, they, they weren't allowed to bring any magazines or current pictures or anything that was more current than 1959. They, were, um, they, they brought pictures of themselves, like back then, and they, you know, it was passed around to the other people, you know, what, what we look like in 1959 or whatever. And um, they had to write their autobiography, it, like in present tense, like as if it was 1959. And every day they would sit and they would like listen to old recordings of radio shows and talk about stuff that happened like back in that period. But they would talk about it like it was actually happening right then. So for an entire week, they just like play, you know, play pretended it was 1959. And they were told, they said, don't imagine, don't uh, act as if it's 1959. Just let yourself be who you were then. 
And so the, the, and so the control group, they went to the exact same place. They went the following week and a lot the same things. Uh, they taught, they discussed things that were, that happened in 1959, but they were talking about it like in past tense, like remember when that happened and all this, they were reminiscing about it instead of being in it. And they wrote their bio, but they wrote it in past tense and all that. So, um, the cool thing is by the second day of both retreats, every single person, there were 16 people, and in both weeks, every single person was up cooking their meals, cleaning up, and doing all that stuff for themselves. And every single one of these people had been extremely dependent on caregivers before the study. And both groups, that totally shifted. So that was kind of cool. Yeah, yeah. Even the control group, it shifted. Both groups did. Um, they were serving meals and cleaning up afterwards and doing all this different stuff. So after the week, both groups were retested, and they showed improvements in hearing, memory, height, weight, gait, posture, joint flexibility, manual dexterity. But the experimental group showed greater improvement, like the ones that were being present tense, showed greater improvement. And on the intelligent test, the experimental group uh, improved 63%, while the control group just uh, improved 44%. And so, uh, and then what they did was they had volunteers that had no idea what the experiment was even about, that didn't know anything, to look at all the before and after pictures, and every single one of the experimental group, the, the objective volunteers, could tell that they looked younger. That's a week. This is not even, this is not even anything to do with the Lord. I mean, this is just the power of our imagination, the way God made us, created in his image with that much power. Now, think about that factoring in, if we're born again, and the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives inside of us to quicken our mortal bodies. That's not even factoring that in. Isn't that a, isn't that a cool story? Isn't that amazing? So this is what the lady said. She said, the study shaped not only my view of aging, but also my view of limits in a more general way for the next few decades. Over time, I have come to believe less and less that biology is destiny. It is not primarily our physical selves that limit us, but rather our mindset about our physical limits. If a group of elderly adults can produce such dramatic changes in their lives, so too can the rest of us. To begin, we must ask if any of the limits we perceive as real do exist. This is not even with the Lord. So now, you know, the Lord showed me that like, We've, as sons of God, he's invited us to this banquet table and here's the world and they're eating these little crumbs that fall from the table. These are the crumbs that fall from the table. And this would be amazing. And we've been invited to a banquet feast. This is so cool. So in the Bible, imagination is all in there if you have eyes to see it. I mean, it's everywhere. And the, the Bible calls the imagination the eyes of our heart. So this is a familiar verse that we know, but you might not have really connected the dots with using your imagination. And I love it in the Passion Translation. I pray that the light of God will illuminate the eyes of your imagination, flooding you with light until you experience the full revelation of a hope of his calling, that is, the wealth of God's glorious inheritances that he finds in us, his holy ones. I pray that you will continually experience the immeasurable greatness of God's power made available to you through faith. Then your lives will be as an advertisement of these, this immense power as it works through you. This is our mighty power that was released when God raised Christ from the dead and exalted him to the place of highest honor and supreme authority in the heavenly realms. So that power is unleashed in our life through the imagination. As the eyes of our imagination are opened, it's available to us all along. But as the eyes of our imagination are opened, we can receive it. Remember, the imagination connects what we know to be true with what we're actually experiencing, and I'll, share, I'll show you how. So the word there, translated as imagination, can also be translated as innermost or heart. So the imagination aligns the eyes of our heart with our natural eyes, so faith becomes sight. Imagination, oh, I think I have it on here. I keep forgetting. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> Imagination aligns the eyes of our heart with our natural eyes so that faith becomes sight. This is so cool. And it's fun. Did you guys know that negative thoughts, they, have, they produce, right? They have, they, have high, they have a frequency and they do create, but positive thoughts are like much more powerful. So when you imagine, right, instead of ruminating, let's say that you've had a lot of pain in your life. 
And let's say every day you go through your life ruminating that over and over and over again, you are creating a loop that you will never get out of. What if your life is really genuinely painful right now? What if you're in a bad marriage or you have a, you have a difficult job or you're in physical pain? What do you do? How do you get out of that loop? with the imagination. Now, again, realize that you're submitted to God. So this is not, I'm going to talk about the defiled imagination and what the difference is. I'm going to talk about the difference because there is a difference. Did you, did you, That's awesome. That's awesome. That's awesome. So you were harnessing the power of your thoughts and your words and your feelings. I guarantee, though, if before you go to sleep at night, you were to picture yourself working faster than you've ever worked, coming home and feeling so great you took a jog around the block, I bet if you consistently pictured that with your imagination every day, it would be what you're already experiencing on steroids. Do it. I would do an experiment, document it, because you're already on the right track. It's so cool. This stuff is so cool. Um, remember when God showed Abraham when he promised him descendants, right? I mean, I'm pretty sure it was really hard for Abraham and 100 to imagine that. I mean, and, he'd, and think the first time God gave him a word, by the time it actually happened, was what, like 17 years or something? I mean, I'm sure he had trouble in the imagination department. Right? I really can't, you know, I really can't picture this anymore. So what did God do, remember? Your descendants are going to be like the stars of the, of the, sky, uh, the stars in the sky and the sand of the sea. He gave them a visual. It's an anchor. Jesus did it. Remember when he said, I think I have this on here too. Yeah, Jesus did it. He said, uh, remember when he said, I do what I see my father doing? He really did. So not only was Jesus... Seeing into the heavenly realm, he was co-conscious of both realms all the time. And he didn't do it out of his divinity. He did it out of his humanity. He was the firstborn among many brethren, so we can be too. This is cool. You know how, well, if you guys have been around ATR for a while, you've heard us say, sometimes, you know, when we're, when, especially Connie does it a lot, when we're framing up some really new concept that we know that for a few weeks you guys are going to be like the cows at a new gate kind of looking thing, you know? What does she always say? Well, I'm just going to frame this up. Do you know that's in the Bible? And do you know it has to do with your imagination? Okay, so Psalm 103. 14, I've always loved this, one of my favorite verses for many years. He knows our frame. He remembers that we're dust. Did you know that the word frame means, it's a Hebrew word, it's Strong's H3336 or whatever, but it means form, framework, or imagination. So this verse literally means that God understands our frame, but that the framework of our life is our imagination. It's the framework of our life. So if you, if you have a situation, maybe, you know, your past was painful and it's continuing to resonate things and you're in a difficult situation right now, you know, maybe you're being oppressed or maybe you've got pain in your physical body and it's hard for you, it's hard for you not to think about that. If you can proactively use your imagination to get out of that loop and start creating something different. Sometimes, now, uh, gratitude is a powerful key because it's harnessing the power of our thoughts and focusing on the positive rather than the negative, right? Because what we focus on, we empower. What we focus on multiplies. So just the power of gratitude brings huge shifts. But sometimes, if, you, if you're in a really difficult time, it might even be hard to find those things to be thankful for. I mean, still look for them, and Holy Spirit will help you find them. But even on top of that, if you can use your imagination to literally picture what God has promised to you, that can get you out of that loop quick because you're going to feel it. You're going to see it. You're going to speak it. You're going to say it. All those things are united, and sometimes that's the fast forward to get you out of a loop that you don't want to be in. I had a um, Years ago, I had this encounter I had an encounter when I, when we first moved into the 
building where that we were for three years, the one over next to the Islamic Center. And I was in there, we were in there vacuuming and cleaning it before we met there the first time. And I was just praying in the spirit. And all of a sudden I saw this huge menorah, like hundreds of feet tall, and I'm walking around it. And I knew, I knew the, this, the, the lamps that burn before the throne of God, those are the seven spirits of God. So I knew that God, and because I'd heard Ian Clayton teach on it, so I knew that that menorah represented the seven spirits who were, who were sent to grow us to maturity. And so we just received them. We've, you know, got, had a lot of ministry for them, from them over the years. And then right after that, right after that little flash, I had another encounter where I was led by the spirit of knowledge, which that's one of the seven spirits, and I knew just in my spirit, in my knower, in this encounter, that it was experiential knowledge. It wasn't book knowledge. And uh, to this elevator. And I pushed the elevator button. I, shook, I pushed the elevator button. I shook hands. We were being very formal with knowledge. And I went on the elevator. And I got off between the third and fourth floors. And so I knew that that was the fourth dimension. And I knew that knowledge, experiential knowledge, was going to be the one to transition me from, what, this three-dimensional reality to the fourth dimension living out of the reality of the unseen realm. And so in Isaiah 11, 2, the passage that talks about wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, the fear of the Lord, and the spirit of the Lord, in that passage, when it talks about knowledge, it comes from the Hebrew word yada, and it literally means to know, to ascertain by seeing. It's revelation knowledge. So it's imagination that frees us from the prison of our natural senses. We think this is real because we were conditioned, you know. And you, you heard the story about how they, um, how they train a, an elephant. Like when it's a little bitty elephant, they tie it with just a very thin rope, you know, to a tree or something like that, and it can't get loose. And then, you know, like years later, you have this humongous beast that could tear the whole house down, but he's still tied to this tree with his little tiny rope. Because it's what he, you know, it's what he's been conditioned to. And we're like that too. We were born into limitation. So we're born again, so we don't have to be under limitation. But we think this is real. But the Bible says that that, real is, that that realm is eternal. This realm is temporal. So we know that that's, the, that's reality and this has to bow to that. But we're transformed by the renewing of our mind. And, and imagination helps us to do that quickly, more quickly. Um, when we use the word and we think the word, and we decree the word, and then we imagine the word, it's quick. It's quicker. So being freed from the prison of our natural senses, all creation knows that the glorious liberty of the sons of God sets the stage for their own release from decay. Yeah. Yeah. have to enter in as a little child. So um, I'm going to wrap up here, but real quick, I want to just talk about two things. The, imagina the enemy knows the importance of the imagination gate. He fights for, he fights for it. He fights for our thoughts. He fights for our heart because he knows the creative power in it. And for him, it's all about usurping authority and dominion so he can he can have his way in the earth realm. If we're standing in our position of authority, co-creating with God, heaven on earth as it is in heaven, then he, you know, he doesn't want us to do that. So what he'll try to do with the imagination gate is he'll either try to defile it or he'll try to close it. And I think most of us have probably fallen in one of those categories or, or sometimes both. But defilement happens whenever we trade with lust or pornography or fantasy or um, stuff that we might have seen with our natural eyes that, you know, you might be struggling with. And again, there's no condemnation. Be honest with where you are on the journey, but just know that that's important to get that gate cleaned so that you can use it to create with God. Um, it's also defiled. This is, I think this is probably something that's even more common with most people. It can also be defiled when we use it as an escape from reality. So there's a difference co-creating a new reality with God, right? That's proactive. That's done out of love. But when we, when we escape reality with fantasy, that's, that's fear motivated. That's what an orphan does. That's what a slave does. That's not what a son does. So there's a difference between creating on purpose with using the imagination to create on purpose with intent and running away from something scary and pretending it's not there. 
not facing it because it's a different heart motivation. One is motivated by authority and love. The other is motivated by fear. So doing that will defile the imagination gate. Sometimes children do this because, you know, you grow up in a difficult situation and everything is too big. You can't, you can't fight. You don't, you, don't, you don't have choices sometimes when you're a child. So sometimes the only thing that, that a child can do is escape inside that world. And God understands that. You know, that's a coping mechanism that at some point has to fall by the wayside and be cleansed so that you can use it rightly. Um, if it resonates a victim, then it's not going to produce the right fruit that you want. But as an overcomer, the imagination is used to conform the external world to spiritual reality. So this, um, the imagination still creates whether it's defiled or not, but when it's defiled, it creates the wrong things. And we now all know this story about the Tower of Babel. Remember, they were prideful. They were uh, going to, you know, they didn't want to submit to God. They were going to build a tower to heaven. That was their own works, doing their own thing, their own way. But what did God say about it? He said that nothing they've imagined will be impossible for them. That's the power of the imagination, the defiled imagination. It still creates, but you don't want what it's, it's going to create. So what did he do? Isn't it interesting? We know the story, what he did. What did he do to take care of this problem? Philip? Yeah, he brought confusion to their words because it's all about agreement, alignment. That was interesting. So another thing that happens in the, is imagination get, get, can get closed. Religious spirit's real good with that. Uh, so, you know, sometimes well-meaning parents or authorities can do it. You know, we don't mean to do it. If, if, if you had parents or spiritual authorities that didn't understand the realm of the spirit. I mean, look at the stuff that, that two-thirds of the Bible is crazy stuff. I mean, really, you read the book of Ezekiel, what if your kid came and told you that they saw that? Oh, honey, you go, back, you go to your room until you can come back and tell the truth. I mean, read that, read it. Read the book of Revelation, for real. I mean, the stuff was crazy. Look at the stuff Isaiah did. I mean, imagine little Johnny, Mommy, God told me to lay in the street naked. Well, no, you just, you, you. So it's easy for us to do that, right? It's easy for authorities to crush the imagination gate if we don't have discernment. So just w one simple, oh, honey, that's just your imagination, can sometimes be enough to close that gate, and it might have to be reopened. If you had spiritual authorities or parents that didn't understand, then you might need to have that gate opened back up. And this is an example in the Bible of what happens when the imagination gate is closed, where there is no vision the people perish. One of the versions says decay. And the interesting thing about that, the word translated vision, the Hebrew word literally means vision, but the origin of that word um, means to gaze at, mentally to perceive, contemplate with pleasure, specifically to have a vision of behold, look, prophesy. It's the imagination. Where there is no imagination, you're, you're not going to thrive because it's how God moves in the earth realm. So play is really important. All you people that have got too, a little too serious, a little too grown up, play is real important. It's a big deal. So it teaches us that when we're not imagining, we're perishing or we're not thriving. What happens is if we're not proactively creating God's will with our imagination gate, with our thoughts, words, and our feelings, then we're going to get tossed about by, by what's happening in this realm. We have to proactively create with God. Um, I'm going to skip here. I'm skipping that part, but it was really good. Revelation 1.8. I'm the, I am the Aleph and the Tav, says the Lord God, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. So out of our oneness with the I am, we create. And isn't it interesting that the is comes first? You would think it would be the was, the is, and the is to come. It's the is, the was, and the is to come. Do you know why? I'll tell you. Uh, first, I want to read this verse. Oh, yeah. Whatever was is, whatever will be is, that's how it always is with God. 
So some of you guys have heard this story. When we, when Sean and I were first kind of waking up to, you know, we'd been kind of in the prophetic realm where you like see, but we, it's like we didn't realize we were there, you know. We, God was kind of transitioning us from the revelatory realm into the realm of encounter. One of the first things that we had, this, the, and some of you guys have heard this story, was that was really fun. As we were at home one day and a friend of his texted him and goes, hey, want to have a Melchizedek meeting? And he's like, what's a Melchizedek meeting? He's like, I don't know. It's just what I heard. So we're like, sure. I mean, who could say no to that, right? <laughs> so we, we just called a few people. It was real short notice. We called a few people and we went over to this guy's house and we laid down in his theater room. There was like six or seven of us. And we... We, you know, we, we, we didn't never been to a Melchizedek meeting before. What do you do at a Melchizedek meeting? I don't know. And so, on, and the cool thing, on the way out the door, my phone rang and I didn't recognize the number and I picked it up. Normally on the way out, I would just have let the voicemail pick it up. But I answered it. It was a friend I hadn't heard from in many, many years. And she's like, oh, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm going to Melchizedek meeting. What's a Melchizedek meeting? I have no idea. We, you know, we have that conversation. He goes, well, that's so funny because I've got a friend right here who just wrote a book on the order of Melchizedek. And so he prayed for us, and that was just a confirmation, like, you're not crazy, and, you know, go to this meeting. It's going to be awesome. So we laid on the floor, and there's, like, total variety of people, like some brand-new believers, like, I mean, just, like, barely saved, and then others of us that had been walking with the Lord for a while. It was just a hodgepodge, and we, we just lay down, put some soaking music on, and one of the friends says to Sean, because Sean had seen Melchizedek before, she goes, Sean, what does he look like? Because I think I saw him. And uh, then as soon as she said that, I'm like, well, I see him leading us up this spiral staircase that I've since realized is the DNA. Took me like 10 years to figure that out. But anyway, it just keeps unfolding. So we went on this whole long journey, this really crazy thing. And the cool part was like most everybody was seeing all the same things at the same time. And it was just, it was fun. It, we, we were accessing the spirit realm through our imagination gate. It was fun. God wants this to be fun. He doesn't want it to be boring. It doesn't mean it's always easy, but there's so much joy. So at the end of this meeting, we, uh, I see Melchizedek, and he's in this golden field. I know it's the harvest. And he's drawing on this whiteboard, and he draws three dots, and he starts to speak to us about these are uh, the, the timeline. I mean, I know time is a spiral, but he was just showing us past, present, and future. And he's, he was explaining to us that the that present is the portal into the eternal realm. And he started saying, this is one of the keys of David. That's how David lived out of the new covenant before the new covenant existed. Remember David said, don't take your Holy Spirit from me? Remember David's tabernacle didn't have a veil? So he started teaching us that David went in through the portal of the present and traveled the timeline. He popped out wherever he wanted. So through the, through the eternal present, which is Jesus, remember what he said? Remember when they said, oh, are you really the son of God? Remember what he said when they all fell down? I am. Like as in, I am that I am. I am. The eternal present is a person. His name is Jesus. He's the portal, right? When he hung on the cross, his flesh was torn. The veil was torn from top to bottom. He is the portal. We enter through his wounded side, and we can access all the realms and dimensions. We can go back and rewrite our story. We can go ahead to our expected end and imagine it and be in it and create it fast, fast. It's all Jesus. So that w he explained, he, so back to Melchizedek, he explained that that's how this worked, that that's how David did this. And later, the Lord showed me. Remember when Solomon, uh, when he, God said, you can have anything? And remember, Solomon asked for wisdom, and it pleased the Lord. But if you, stu if you look at that verse when Solomon said that, he said, uh, I, I need wisdom. I'm just a child. I don't know how to go in and out. He knew his father, David, knew how to go in and out, but he didn't know yet he needed wisdom to help him. He knew his father knew how to travel the dimensions through the portal of the present. So after this, a couple years, I went through a period where every time I would lead worship or worship him at home or whatever, I would see, I would see Jesus' face just beautiful, and I would see his eyes, and they're like, you get sucked in. I'm like, they're, sometimes they look like fire, and sometimes they look like water, and sometimes they look like galaxies, and it's like, you're just getting drawn in, you know, it was just this glorious thing. And that happened for a while, maybe like a couple of months, and then one, one time I was worshiping, and I saw the diagram that Melchizedek had drawn for us on the timeline superimposed over Jesus' face, right, with the two eyes. And the middle, the present, was right here. 
The occult calls it the third eye. That's a counterfeit. But our pineal gland is back here. Jacob understood it. Remember when Jacob wrestled with God and he saw God face to face? Do you remember what he named the place? Pineal, for I've seen God face to face. That's why the counterfeit, remember they, they, some of the counterfeits put the dot right here? They're claiming that portal, but it belongs to us, the sons of God. This is good stuff. Oh, and I think I have some things way back there. Uh, eternal present is your portal. Oh, so, so um, trying to go fast here. Okay, so I want to read you one real quick thing. You guys good for about five more minutes? Okay. So um, the eternal present, I want to read something that will real, it's real short that the Lord said to me about the present. It's an invitation for you too. It's really beautiful. He said, come into my heart, child, beloved. It is your true home in the deep, deep caverns of my passion for you, the many mansions in my heart. You will remember, you will be. And from that place of I am, you will begin to dream and to imagine clearly and specifically. This is so long ago, I didn't even understand any of this then, but it was his invitation. Come and step into the largest of, largeness of my heart and the immenseness, immenseness of my thoughts toward you. In this place, they are not dreams but reality, for everything exists in its entirety in my heart. And everything you see, experience, and remember there is yes and amen. The only work lies in birthing it into the tangible realm, giving it form and substance. And even then, our work is joyous, exuberant play as we dance and create together. That's the invitation. This is good stuff. So I kind of, I don't have enough time to really give the rest of this justice. But I will say this. Um, in May of this year, the Lord started speaking to me about going through the portal of the present and rewriting my story because there was a couple areas that I would stuck. Remember where there's fruit, there's a root, right? So I saw that there were things that repeating cycles of just different, of things in my life, uh, like um, disappointment and hope deferred and things like that. And Holy Spirit started to show me that those things went all the way back to the very beginning of my life. And he said, rewrite your story. So first I was excited. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to rewrite my story. And then I got stumped. I'm like, well, how do I rewrite my story? Like, you know, I don't want different people or, you know, I mean, it's like, you know, I don't want to trade anybody in. What do I do? So it's a very long story that I won't go into tonight. You'll have to get the book. But um, the short version is he showed me how to go back in. And instead of focusing on what was happening in the natural realm, to focus on what was happening in the spirit realm and to feel those feelings, right? So for example, this is just an example. So if maybe um, you were conceived under difficult circumstances and you weren't wanted in the natural, he said, Jesus, the, look, at, look at the birth of my son. Because everybody thought he was illegitimate, right? There was a lot of pressure there, especially in that culture. But he said, take a look in the spirit realm. Look at the angels welcoming his birth. Look at what was happening in the spirit realm. So he was beginning to show me how to rewrite my story. Like you don't, you know, you don't, well, I want Arnold Schwarzenegger to be my dad. No, you don't do that. But you see your dad through the lens of who God has created him to be. And you imagine how he would have treated you had he been that person. And you think those thoughts and you feel those feelings and you be that person. Because you can go back and rewrite your story. So that husband that was a knucklehead that you divorced 30 years ago, well, you can go back and imagine if he loved you the way Jesus loved the church and laid down his life for her and how you would have felt and what you would have done. You can rewrite your present story. So again, it's not escaping reality, pretending like I'm scared, I'm a victim, I'm, too, I'm helpless, I don't want to face it. It's not that. It's proactively going, okay, maybe, you know, maybe my wife is a shopaholic and she's driving me crazy, but I, that's, not the real per, that's not the real person. That's a garment of false identity that she's wearing. Who is she really? What kind of relationship do we really have? And imagining that and creating that. 
You know, maybe that string of broken relationships that broke your heart over and over and over again. They were different, different guys wearing, same guy wearing a different face. You can rewrite your story and come up to present. The Holy Spirit has to show you how to do it. There's no formula here. But the cool thing about the, I'm at, I'm at the point where he's showed me a couple of other things now that are more recent that I need to rewrite. Like I said, this is my classroom. But the ones that I, that I wrote before, every single one of them, he brought me to something in Jesus' life. Like, hey, check this out. It was exact parallel, every single thing. I mean, you could, I couldn't, I don't have time to share it, but I could not have made this up. Every single thing that he had me rewrite was a parallel to something that Jesus experienced when he was in flesh on this earth. So, I mean, he'll show you, you'll have your own journey, but just know you can do it. Know that God's invited you to come through his, into, into him, the I am, and you can rewrite your story so that you can resonate something different, so you can receive something different. So you have grid. You might only have a grid for abusive relationships. So if you've been, if your dad abused you and every boy you ever dated abused you, and then you date this guy who treats you, well, he's too nice. I don't like him. Well, he's not familiar, as in familiar spirit. Got to change your grid. You're not going to be comfortable because it's not, it's something's different in you. And every time you, every time you get a new relationship, it's going to be that same thing wearing a different, different cover until you change on the inside. And this is a way to do it quickly. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool stuff. So you can rewrite your story. And then I'll end with this. So also you can go in through the portal of the I am and you can come out in your expected end. I love this verse. We all know this verse. Oh, just to say this, when you rewrite your story, you can also do this on a daily basis too. You can come to the end of your day and let's say uh, you traded with a spirit of road rage and you, the guy cut you off in traffic and you flipped him off and then you felt bad, you repented, whatever, you know, but, but you can rewrite that. Now, I'm not saying repentance isn't enough, but you can rewrite it because you're changing who you are. You're changing that, those ruts that have been formed of rage that have been formed in your soul and it'll help you get out of them quicker. I mean, the blood is enough. We know that. You, but do you guys understand you can do this on an ongoing basis? Get in a fight with your wife. Okay, you can rewrite that story. You can be kind next time. All right, so then uh, the expected end. I had a really cool story here, but I don't have time for it. Okay, we all know this verse. It's so cool, but it's Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, the thoughts. It all starts with the thoughts of the Father. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. Then shall you call upon me and you shall go and pray unto me and I will hearken unto you. So in other words, when we go to the expected end, unlike the double-minded man who doesn't receive what he prays for, God will respond when we're in our expected end. And you shall find me when uh, you, sh- and when you shall seek me, you shall find me when you shall search for me with all your heart, not divided heart. It's all right there. So through my oneness with the, the is, the was, and the is to come, I can manifest in the earth the promises of God, which are spiritual realities that are already yes and amen in the Father's heart. So the key here. And I think this is where some of us miss it. Um, How many of you prayed, oh, for that breakthrough, right? We all have something we're praying for. How many of you pray for that thing? Yes, this is a trick question. But how many of you pray for that thing? Everybody's scared to raise their hand. How many of you pray from that thing? So when you're praying for that thing, you don't have it yet, right? So what do you feel? Feelings of not having it. Lack. Which produces more lack. So what if you pray from it, then what do you feel? You feel the feelings of having it. And our feelings, we attract what we resonate. So when we resonate having it, what happens? 
Exactly. It's a spiritual principle. It's all in the Word. I don't have time for all these. I don't have time for all the scriptures, but it's all in there. We all know the scriptures. But that's how that, and I think that's where sometimes I think Holy Spirit's just tweaking us ever so slightly. Because we're used to being, we're used to operating as orphans and slaves. Oh, make more bricks. One day I'll be in the promised land. One day I'll be in the promised land. No, you are there. So when we can learn to do that, and the imagination is the easiest way to do that, and then when our prayers and our declarations come out of that place, it's, it's exponential, exponential increase. Because you're no longer double-minded. You're not praying, oh, God, give me that financial breakthrough, heart resonating, I'm poor, I'm poor, I'm poor, I'm desperate, I don't have a financial breakthrough, double-minded man. So you imagine yourself specific, looking at your check, the amount on the check. And again, this is all subject to being submitted to the will of the Father. Okay, that's understood. Okay, we're not talking about stupid stuff. We're talking about the Roman centurion, I'm under authority, I'm in authority. Imagining uh, what your life would look like. Imagining what you would do when you get up in the morning if you're not working 80 hours a week or whatever. Think from that place and then from that place, pray because your father already knows what you need. Make your declarations out of that place when your thoughts, feelings, and words are aligned And then you're a channel through which they can flow because miracles are normal. So I want to end with this. This is something the Lord said to me. So um, I think just we're going to end this way. I'm going to, if you guys can put on that quiet music, and then I'm just going to read something that the Lord said to me about dreaming that I think will bless you. I read it one other time, so it might be repeat to some of you guys. And then if you just want to sit, if you guys need to go, because I know it's, it's 930, if you guys need to go, that's fine. But if you just want to sit, I mean, there's a lot of seeds that are floating around in this atmosphere. There's a lot of just um, to, to be taken advantage of if you want to sit here. And just imagine, okay, whatever that thing is that you're contending for, that thing that Holy Spirit's got his finger on right now. Practice this, because it takes practice. We're used to ruminating on the past. We're used to creating out of lack and orphanhood. But this is new territory, and God understands that, this grace. But it's like going to the gym. You don't walk over to the, you know, pick the 100-pound barbell. You know, you just, you, you or whatever, you, you practice. Start small. The Lord told me when I first started, he said, set your timer for 15 minutes every day and just imagine. And I had to write it in my journal because my mind would wander so much. So I just wrote in my journal what I was imagining. And 15 minutes sounded like a long time because it was a new practice, but it went by so quick. So I'm going to read this. And then if you guys want to stay and just engage with what you've learned, we want to be doers of the word, not just hearers. And really tap in. And also, I think the prayer team will be over by the door. If you guys need personal ministry, that's open as well. And then I'm just going to read this, and then we're just going to kind of seal it up. So are you guys okay just kind of staying or going or whatever, (laughs) kind of leaving it open? So this is what the Lord said to me, and I believe he's saying it to you too. Do not be afraid to dream, to envision, to desire. It is not carnal. It is not selfish. Nor will your dreams be too small, as you've supposed. Goals which are imposed on you from without are too small. But those dreams which emerge from your heart is the outflow of my heart in you. You are made in this way to create with me. It sounds spiritual to defer to me, but that's religion. I will not deviate from this pattern in creating with and through you. You must remain in a place of submission, allowing me to guide and direct those dreams. You must allow them to die, as you've learned. And you must give me permission to work with places of idolatry, but I will not dream for you. I've placed my dreams within you from eternity past. They are already within you, yet you're waiting on me to give them to you from without. Some people spend their whole lives waiting for this, wandering in a wilderness of uncertainty and purposelessness. Do not die in this wilderness. It sounds so spiritual saying you trust me and that my thoughts are higher than yours, and they are. 
but you have forgotten that my thoughts are within you because I am within you. You've learned to not walk in presumption, to not lean on your own understanding. You've learned to submit to me, to ask me, to listen to me, to eat from my hand, the tree of life. But now you must learn to dream my dreams. You must accept responsibility for the dreams, desires, and destiny that I have already placed within you. I not only give you permission to dream, but I require that you dream. I've chosen not a puppet, but a bride, a bride with her own thoughts, feelings, desires, personality, and identity. It's time to embrace the dreams and desires that I've placed within you. Look into your spirit and you will remember what you already said yes to. So just be true to the passions and desires that arise for springtime has come. You did well to remain steadfast and obedient during the winter season when the old desires were dying away, the shedding of a skin much too small. But now you must look within and embrace the dreams of this butterfly season. You've grown accustomed to caterpillar options and restrictions. You've grown accustomed to the death of desire, but it is time to wake up. Do not fear disappointment, for this is the season for you to create with your dreams. Don't worry about the uncertainties. Just start by being true to the desires you know are there. Do not stifle or censor them, judging them as selfish or frivolous. Am I not well able to convict and to correct you? Start by simply acknowledging the desires you know are there, even though they may be small and sparse at first. Just like the beginning of a spring shower, the first few drops simply lead the way for the downpour. So think of whatever it is now. You can close your eyes, write in your journal, whatever is comfortable for you. Think about whatever it is that Holy Spirit has bubbled up, bubbling up in you. It's probably, probably one thing. So when does it happen? How does it happen? What are you wearing? How do you feel? What do you see? 